It is a joy to be together this morning, and we are continuing in our sermon series, Mark and Moses, a modern conversation. Today, we are in Exodus chapter 13. Now, a lot has transpired in Exodus chapters 1 through 12. So, you know how in TV shows, they'll say, previously on Downton Abbey, (laughs) right? Today, we're going to do previously in Exodus Okay, except I'm not going to keep that voice the whole time. (laughs) So, so far in the book of Exodus, we open with the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, enslaved in Egypt. God appoints a man named Moses to be the deliverer, to be the one that leads the people out of slavery. He encounters God at the burning bush. You may remember that story. He goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go the famous line, and Pharaoh says, no. So it takes 10 warnings from God, which are called plagues, until the Pharaoh finally relents and says, okay, just go. The final plague is the death of the firstborn. We heard about this two weeks ago. The firstborn of all human and animals die, but God provides a substitute. God provides a way out. He tells the people that if they sacrifice an unblemished lamb and cover their house, the doorframe of the house, with the blood, then they will be passed over. And this is where we get the practice of Passover. And God introduced a special meal to commemorate this day. We might call it a Seder meal today. If you have friends who are Jewish who might practice Passover, this is where that comes from. So, The Passover Seder meal was used to commemorate the fact that the lamb died instead of the people, and that the people were set free from their bondage in Egypt to go forth to the promised land. That was what's happened so far in Exodus. So we pick up our story today. The people of God have been given the green light to leave Egypt, and they begin this pilgrimage to an unknown land. But they don't really know exactly where they're going. God has said, I'm going to lead you to a land. They don't know where they're going, but they do know that God is with them. Perhaps some of us can relate to that sentiment. Personally, professionally, in our lives, we don't know exactly where we're going, but we can hold to the fact that God is with us. So let's pray and we'll hop into our text. Lord, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for your words of scripture and we pray that they would come alive to us in these moments, that you would teach us something about who you are and who we are as we study your word. We surrender to you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's start with verses one through 10, Exodus 13, they'll be on the slides and in your bulletin. Verse one, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today, in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land that he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders." On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that this law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in this first set of 10 verses, we are introduced to two ideas. First, in verses 1 to 2, God introduces the consecration of the firstborn. That word consecrate is not a word we use very often in everyday life. It basically means to be set apart, 
to be set apart from a common use for a special use, to be dedicated to God. So we see here the firstborn are to be consecrated to God. And the end of our passage, we'll get more into that. So we're going to put a pin in that festival and we'll come back to it. We're going to start with what is described in verses 3 to 10, the feast of unleavened bread. These two feasts are ways that the Israelites are to remember and honor the events of the past few months. So in verse 3, Moses says, commemorate this day. The word here, commemorate, again, is not a a word we use very often. It comes from the Hebrew, zahar, which has a twofold meaning. It means to cognitively remember and to ritually commemorate. So this word, commemorate, has a cognitive and an active element to it. And the people of God are given pretty clear instructions about how to commemorate. Introducing the Feast of Unleavened Bread, This feast is a seven-day period in which the people of God are to abstain from anything with yeast in it. And you might think, why yeast, right? What does this have to do with anything? It comes back to the Exodus story. When God delivered the people, they left pretty quickly, so there wasn't even time for the bread to rise. Flat bread only. And another fun fact, in Hebrew, the word is matzah, which is where we get matzah. There you go. So you can say you know lots of Hebrew words, too, now so far today. Anyway, the abstention from the yeast reminds the Israelites of the Passover meal, which we learned about in the previous chapter. They left Egypt in haste, so they didn't even have time to wait for the bread to rise. So the purpose of this feast is remembering, commemorating the way that God has delivered them. Now, today, if um, among the Jewish culture, the... Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread have basically been kind of fused into one. So if you may know, people celebrate Passover right around this time of year. That is the Passover meal plus this seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. But Passover is much easier to say than the Feast of Unleavened Bread. (laughs) So it's known collectively as one unit. Now, there's a phrase in here that is key as well. So we know what they're commemorating. They're commemorating when they came out. And then they remember how they came out. What does it say? The Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. This phrase is key. The exodus is attributed to the Lord and his strength. This phrase, with a mighty hand, speaks to the power of God. So it's the Lord's strength and power that brought the people out of Egypt. In verse 8, we're introduced to the second purpose of the feast. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So this feast is both to commemorate the past and to communicate to the future generations about what God has done. They are to consecrate these seven days, commemorate the work of God, and communicate it to the next generation. We're going to see this same threefold pattern play out in our next text So we have two festivals today, and we have three words. Our three words are consecrate, commemorate, communicate. So as we keep reading, keep an eye out in our next text for those three ideas. All right, 11 to 16. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In the days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord has brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord has brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Okay, so we see a lot of parallels between the first passage we read and the second one. A lot of the language there is similar. A sign on your hand, a symbol on your forehead, tell your sons but this time it's in reference to the second festival, the consecration of the firstborn. The whole idea behind this is that the firstborn of Israel were spared during the 10th plague. Therefore, as a response to that mercy, 
the people of God are to dedicate, to consecrate their firstborn to the Lord. So we have in here the idea of consecration, our three C's. Is in the first feast, Israel was to consecrate seven days, set apart seven days with no, uh, no leavened bread. Here, they're to consecrate the firstborn. Commemorate. The first festival commemorated the, the quickness of their escape from Egypt. And this commemorates, remembers, the way that the Passover spared their firstborn. And then completing our trifecta, we have an echo in 14 of what we had in verse 8. In the days to come, when your son asks, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So both sections also are going to end with these parallel statements. Verse 9 and verse 16 say the practices will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead. Now, um, this is kind of a fun fact for history nerds out there. Um, You may be familiar with the uh, practice of phylacteries. So this is, within Orthodox Judaism, um, individuals will have little boxes on their forehead or on their wrist with the words of scripture in them. So it's a way to very literally have the law of the Lord between your eye and on your wrist. I think about an equivalent of how maybe we wear a cross necklace or we have a ring or we have something that reminds us and marks us as um, belonging to the Lord, a way we remember. So these two festivals are all about remembering, these active remembering that includes consecrating, commemorating, and communicating. Now, I had an experience recently where I saw these three C's in action. I went to my first NBA game. Go with me here. Okay. Are there any Knicks fans in the house? Only t- like three? Oh, okay, okay, okay. There's more. Okay. Whew. All right. This is not going to go well. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so, a few weeks ago, I had the very joyful opportunity to attend my first ever NBA game, Knicks versus the Sixers at Madison Square Garden. It was amazing. As I walked into the garden, I realized this is a set apart space. Everything in this entire place is oriented towards this one game. Everywhere you look, people are decked out. <laughs> They're consecrated, they've set themselves apart. They say, I belong to the Knicks, right? This is a set-apart space. Now, I will say, this is not holy in the sense that God is holy. Even the most diehard Knicks fans hopefully can see that distinction. But it was a set-apart space where everything was oriented towards this one goal. After the game, I was given this commemorative cup. Now, this is really the only time we use the word commemorative in everyday life is commemorative cups. Knicks playoffs 2024. Every time I see this cup, I will remember, oh, that game was so fun, the crowds, the cheering, excellent. Now, I have to tell you, throughout the game, there was a lot of communication. (laughs) Um, The gentleman sitting next to me had a lot to communicate to the refs, to the coaches, to the players. But the primary thing that was communicated throughout the game was the cry, Let's go Knicks, right? This was the rally cry of the crowd. So we have this pattern in life and we have this pattern in the Exodus. When we care about something, we consecrate, we set apart time for it, we commemorate it, we remember it, and we communicate, we tell others about it. So this threefold pattern is seen in scripture and in life. All right, let's go back from the basketball court back to the Bible. All right, we're going to look at our final section of Scripture, starting at verse 17. Okay. And this section, we started with a recap, right? We said, previously in Exodus. Now, we get a preview. Coming soon to churches near you. In two weeks, this is giving us a preview of what's to come. All right, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country though that way was shorter. God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. 
He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they encamped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them, and by night, a pillar of fire to give them light, so they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Okay, so this passage is a preview of what is to come. They're headed towards the Red Sea. You might be having flashbacks to the Prince of Egypt movie or a flannel board from Sunday school. So come back in two weeks to find out what happens. But there's a few interesting things that we can notice here. One, God does not take them on the most direct route. Why? Well, it seems that God knows his people. He knows their proclivities, that like us, we get scared and run away sometimes. He knows that the best thing for them is the circuitous route. Have you been in a circumstance where it seems like God was taking you on a very indirect route? When you can see, oh, the clearest way to get from here to there is a straight line, but God leads you the long way? If so, we're in good company. And we can take courage because just because it's not the most efficient route, it doesn't mean that it's not where God is guiding us. The second thing to note is this pillar of cloud and fire. The people have left everything they've known. For 400 years, their people have been in Egypt, have been enslaved, have been under the Pharaoh's thumb, and now they're set sail on this new adventure. And what's the comfort on their journey? The presence of God. This pillar of fire and pillar of cloud are a reminder to the people that God is with them. This same reminder is for us as well. When we find ourselves in unknown territory, when we find ourselves in a place where everything familiar is floating away, the same God who is with the Israelites is with us. Now, we may not see a pillar of fire moving down the post road, but that would be awesome. but that same God is with us, that same God. So in two weeks, we'll pick up the narrative when the people arrive at the Red Sea. They're going to be stuck between a rock and a hard place, and we're gonna see what God will do. So stay tuned. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground this morning. We've been introduced to two practices by which Israel is invited to remember the Exodus, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Consecration of the Firstborn. And these two feasts will be practiced generation after generation after generation. And hundreds of years later, Jesus and his friends would be celebrating the Passover. And in the midst of the meal, they'll be remembering the ways that God delivered his people from Egypt. And Jesus will pick up a piece of the matzah. He'll pick up a piece of the flatbread and he'll give thanks for it. He'll break it and he'll give it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after the meal as they've remembered the way that the blood covered the door frame, he'll pick up one of the cups of wine that's red like blood. And he'll say, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He'll tell them that instead of the sacrifice year after year of lamb after lamb, Christ the Lamb of God would die once for all. This Last Supper, which took place at Passover, was our first communion. It follows this threefold pattern that we see when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. The ordinary elements of bread and juice are set apart, they're consecrated for a purpose. We commemorate, we remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that has set us free, and we communicate. We read in 1 Corinthians, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So our very practice of communion involves these three C's. Consecrate, commemorate, communicate. Our practice of communion weaves us into a story much larger than our own. We're in a spiritual family that extends across continent and millennia. And so the story of Exodus can, in a very real sense, be our story. So what's the invitation of this text for you and for me, whatever the rest of this day and this week might bring us? Well, let's go back to our three C's. Consecrate, 
One, as we've talked about, this text can add a new layer of depth to the practice of communion. We can recognize the ways that we are part of a larger story, that our practice of communion goes back all the way to the very first Passover. And we're likewise invited to dedicate ourselves to God. We dedicate ourselves to many things, do we not? I will be dedicating myself to the Knicks game this afternoon, 3.30. As we dedicate ourselves to our teams, to our hobbies, to our families, what does it look like for us to dedicate ourselves, to consecrate ourselves to the Lord? Commemorate. This text invites us to remember, to actively commemorate, remember the way that God has been faithful in our lives. Are there places or dates or things that remind you of God's faithfulness? Maybe it's a song that God ministered to you through. Maybe it's a Bible verse. Maybe it's being out at Weed Beach. The invitation is to remember, to remember the way that God has set us free, to commemorate God's work individually and collectively. Third, communicate. Later today, we'll be communicating. Let's go next. And this is cheesy, but we're gonna go with it, guys. If your life had a rally towel, what would your rally towel say, right? The collective witness of this crowd at MSG is let's go Knicks. But what would your rally towel say? Let's go God? If you're Gary, that's what your rally towel says. <laughs> right? He's not even here for this joke. Um, what is it that our life communicates? The invitation of this text is to see all of our life as an opportunity for consecration, commemoration, and communication. Like the Israelites, we can say, God set me free. I was one way and God's changed me. God is making me into a new person. This is the hope of the gospel. This is the hope that we have in Christ. And this is the way that we're woven into this larger story. So this week, let's consecrate ourselves, dedicate ourselves afresh and anew to the God who loves us. Let's commemorate, let's remember the way that God has been faithful. And let's communicate through the lives that we live, the way that we have been set free in Jesus. Amen.